Welcome again, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can join the YouTube channel directly or head over to patreon.com slash oxum or oxum.substack.com. Today, our guest is Sammy. How are you doing today? What's good, brother? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Um, we, I, I think we've had several different discussions over the years, but never really like a super direct combo. So I'm, I'm glad to have it um, today over different topics like religion, politics, and and history. I guess I'm more interested in um, talking about some general history and then getting into some specific history. I'm I'm curious, did you grow up in a household in which Ethiopian history was taught? Or um, I, I actually don't know if you were more back home or... Uh, in the West, like, did you ever learn it within a curriculum at school? Well, I was raised in, in, in North America for pretty much almost my entire life. So it, I was, mm -hmm. I was raised here and everything. Um, personally, I grew up in a household where uh, I was taught about Ethiopian history for sure, uh, particularly by my mom. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I, from there, it was I was taught more of the basics. It wasn't really like in like uh, you know instilled into me, but from my exposure into there, you know, my gradual interest started to grow and grow and grow until it became to a point where I became like a history nerd. And I would go into the library, <laughs> sneak off into the library without telling my family. <laughs> it got to that point, um, so it was a bit nice. of. Uh, um, of course, for sure, nurture, but more so of nature, because I kind of just want the. I kind of went to an extreme where I was always immersing myself in, and trying to find out more, being very fascinated about our our history, Ethiopian history in particular, and, and then from there into uh, world history in, in general. Uh, so to answer your question, of course, it was both, but I've always been a very, uh, very interested in finding, uh, being very interested and fascinated, uh, but also taken very much uh, pride in our history from there. A lot of my my pride in my my nationality, my my Ethiopia, my Ethiopian identity was from uh, was intertwined from there. Yeah, so that's a good point. I I grew up in a household where, uh, you know, my mother's father is from Gondar, and so she had some images of like the Fasil castles and stuff like that, where she would mention that, but she yeah. never really talked about where her mother was from, and my dad refused to say at all, even when directly asked where any of his family's from. They both grew up in Addis in Mercato and Kapanna. And for me, like, that's it. That's as much as they would ever tell me, like, ethnic identity, I literally didn't understand until I was in my 20s, about a decade ago. So I'm wondering, did you grow up in a similar way? Because I'm hearing you say, like, the Ethiopian nationality, or did, you, like, uh, which sounds like how I grew up. Um, yeah. Or were you given more specific knowledge of like, I don't know if you had any particular uh, jagnoch that were involved in Ethiopian history that they told you, or was just like the generic, you know, we've never been colonized, Ainat Nagar. Um, but like, how, how did, how were you raised in that environment? And when did you become kind of aware of uh, any, you know, sub uh, identifiers underneath Ethiopian? That's actually a really good question. And it's a question I ask a lot of my personal friends or colleagues that um, you know that I uh, interact with because I do think that ethnicity has to do with that. I think part of it uh, is like that. Also, my parents were also born in, and raised in Addisawa. They were also mm -hmm. born in, in the city as well. Uh, uh, I think what I've noticed because my family is Gurage, um, and I also kind of, it's, it's something I bring up because I was always raised as Ethiopian first. That was my 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 Ethiopian net was you know that was the way that I was raised. So that was the way that it was instilled within me. That was the way that you know the values and the principles I was raised with was connected with that. But at the same time, I knew from a very 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 early age about my ethnic identity. Um, so that wasn't really in conflict. And I do know that a lot of people who who um, particularly uh, tend to come from the Amara ethnic group who are often raised with the same values about you know uh, loving each other and loving unity and undernet but ethnic consciousness was not really wasn't really something that people grew up with for the most part especially if they were born and raised in Addis Ababa yeah. uh, also in other places but especially in Addis Ababa and yet at the same time I also knew my ethnic identity but it also didn't conflict with my love for my country it was something I was raised with but at the same time 
I never, um, I wasn't really taught much about my ethnic identity. I wasn't really raised up with knowing about any of that beyond you know the parameters of oh, loving you know for mezcal or or kitful. We always spoke, we always, <laughs> you know, so you we, control in the house, control, you know, all that kind of stuff. It, it wasn't really brought up like that. Um, mm. We only spoke Amharic. We we didn't speak the. We only That's what I was going to ask you because uh, yeah. if you had the language identity, I guess the Gurage identity would be more obvious. But you didn't have that. Well, most most Guragis, if they especially from Abdisawa, because you know we basically colonized Abdisawa. <laughs> um, you know, we were raised. A lot of the times, uh, language isn't seen as a priority. Um, language and and identity isn't really seen as connected with each other, as it might be the as it might be the case with other ethnic groups. Um, you know, you are a Guragi, even if you know if you were you know you are a Guragi, you're proud to be a Guragi but you don't necessarily speak it. My parents don't speak Guragin yet either. Actually, wow. I'm better uh, I'm better than them in Guragin than they are because uh, it's about, you know, wanting to learn and mold yourself into that. Um, particularly, and the reason why I say that isn't because Guragin are, are ashamed of learning their language, but more so uh, because as, as a people who are immersed in commerce, in, in commerce, in trade, uh, you know, learning Amharic or the lingua franca of the country is a necessity. Learning, you know, you can't communicate with other people if you speak your local language. So speaking Amharic was seen more of a priority. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not saying that's ne <laughs> neither good or bad. It's, there's positives and negatives in both of that. But um, as, as it doesn't reflect on a pride of their identity because it's very immersed, immersed in our household, you know, learning about the values and talking with other people, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Well, that's very fascinating, especially this point that you said that you uh, you won up to your parents in language. Um, did you do that by interacting with grandparents? Like, did you have access to your grandparents either in the West or did you visit them back home? Or was it through like grammar books of Guraginya that you're running through? Well, um, <laughs> grammar books and dictionaries don't help. <laughs> they really don't help. I've tried. It, it doesn't help with that. My my the we the reason I was able to and I'm not fluent though, so don't take my word. I'm not fluent at all. I understand it much more than I can speak it. I can you know, do all that kind of stuff. But um, for me, the biggest help was um, from talking and forcing my other aunts and my uncles to speak to me through the phone. Oftentimes, uh, because um, even though, like I said. Um, you know, uh, language isn't seen as a, as a priority for a lot of us uh, growing up in, in the West or, or even in Addisawa. I was still very self-conscious about wanting to learn more about that. So I basically forced my older, my older, older relatives often who live in Ethiopia or who live in the West uh, who can speak it to force it to speak it, uh, it towards me. So it was from there that I gradually started to uh, encompass myself with the language and hearing about it. And it isn't particularly difficult because it's very close to Amharic. Uh, so if you have a grasp on Amharic, learning uh, the, some of the varieties, some of the varieties are actually closer to Amharic than others, isn't, it's not particularly like a, it's not rocket science. So it was from there, but um, yeah, like I'm always uh, guilt tripping my parents, my, my mom in particular about trying to learn the language and everything. So I sometimes uh, translate what some people are saying. <laughs> Towards her, but uh, yeah, it's it's jokes. No, that that's awesome. Like I um, am even reflecting on what you said earlier. Um, yeah, you know, m most of my family is Amhara, and they never said that. They never used the word Amhara uh, yeah. for like more than twenty years of my life. And uh, part of that is like this thing that I've heard before that you know, power seeks to hide itself. You know, it's seen as nowhere. It seems as improper in some sense to. Yeah um delineate that and particularly in a melting pot like Addis Ababa where people are um getting married now I poke fun at my parents a little bit because they're like the most Katame of Katame like the most urbanites right like even um my dad's parents grew up in Deredawa and, and Harar which are themselves like big cities and so like you, you really start to see their they're not like the first generation of modern people. They're like the second or third generation, depending on which side you you go to. And uh, and yet they happened to both find another Shoah Amhara, like my mom's side 
her mom's side is from Shoa. My dad, all of his family is from all over Shoa. You know, Minjar, Mens, Tagulet, all this. Again, I learned this from his sisters and his mom. Never from he never said anything outside of Adbis Ababa. I even had to like get somebody else to tell me Mercato, you know, not even him. So it's interesting that you point that out. It's the same with me. I didn't find out about most of the ancestry and everything out of my family doesn't come from my 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 parents. It came from my extended family members who were a lot more eager to tell me uh, yeah. about that, you know, um, particularly because uh, they are more exposed to that. Um, I have like, even when I went back to Ethiopia, anytime I go back to Ethiopia, I would always have relatives coming over and, you know, they would, they would always talk about certain things and I would grasp, I would try to grasp what they're saying, not in terms of the language, but in yeah. terms of the subject, they would talk about certain areas and like, I remember hearing about this area. Well, I remember hearing about my grandparents, my, my grandparents' birth area. And from there, I'm, you know, as a, as a naturally curious person, I'm always asking uh, to the point where I've annoyed them about, yep. you know, about these things. So absolutely. And also what you said was also like um, what I try to ask my, my friends, you know, uh, people who I discuss with uh, in the relationship between ethnicity, ethnic identity or ethnic consciousness and, you know, pride in your, uh, in your nationality, mm -hmm. because a lot of times I've seen um, many people who are of Amara uh, ancestry or or uh, um, ethnically ethnic Amara, you know, it was like, like you said, even saying the word, invoking the word Amara, not just uh, it was seen as no, but it pissed people off from my, from my own interactions. Like, Amara, Amara, ta, 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 ta. You don't, don't say that. Don't, don't kind of say that. And I'd be like, what's the problem? <laughs> Like it's it's your identity. There's no there's no problem with that. And it wasn't just Amharas who were saying that. It wasn't even other ethnic groups who were saying that as well. So I'm just like I, I don't under, I I'm I'm no I'm I'm not shameful about my ethnicity. I'll say it if someone mm -hmm. asks someone I you know whatever. I I just I say I'm Ethiopian. But if it's someone I'm cool with, I have no problem saying with my ethnicity. Why is it? Why is there a double standard where it comes to Amharas? You know that was something I was always like I I didn't understand for the longest time. Yeah, I, I think it was never, it was never 100%, it's obvious, but I think it's like, it's almost like the Jewish question in the United States, but it's different because they're the dominant, the Amhara were in a sense like that. It's like you see them in majority positions of power, and you question, you know, is it just nepotism, or was there some merit to how that happened? And, I th and then the changing regimes and the politics, I think, led led to that um but i have like an uncle who agrees with like professor mesfin from back in the day you know that conversation he had with medalist on tv um you know about how he was breaking it down and talking about how everyone really repped their local regions um harder than they did the the larger kind of identities that the people have been compelled to now over the the past few decades and i remember medalist gave him pushback because he's like then you're going to say there's no such thing as tigray um you know because all these different areas were never really together and there's some truth to to some of that pushback as well because they were kind of disparate districts and entities uh Waradawich and Aurajawich and on all these different um prefectures whatever the 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 region or state was was called at the time they, they did kind of shift so i'm impressed too with the fact that you grew up uh fully in the west i thought for some reason you might be back home so you're more you really are like a lot like me then in that respect how did you retain amharic then i imagine the people around you didn't i could tell you the people in los angeles were very weak and i could give you an, even an example i had uh, another day friend who had heard something in the news the other day and he came up to me and again when we were kids i had no idea he was other but i i learned it now and he's like there's such thing as an Amharic ethnicity. And he thought it was the funniest thing in the world because he thought his ethnicity was Amharic. He thought just like Ethiopia has like, like Korea, like it's Korea, like one language Amharic. He didn't even know that like his dad knows another language, you know? And, and it's funny because my dad knows a little bit of that language too, just because he grew up around some people like that. Yeah. No, um, that's actually interesting. I have found that people who come from other ethnic groups beyond the major the the major groups uh, are often raised in the cultures that they. I, I have a lot of people who are um, I know a lot of people who are Haredi 
and they always almost always identify with their ethnic identity uh more so than others and it's like the case with a lot of different ethnic groups uh beyond the the typical amara to great oromo Guraki kind of thing so that's what i found so i think that was what you said was kind of interesting yeah what makes my friend different is that his dad is a non-religious muslim and his his mom is a christian i don't know her her background but she's some type of protestant christian and so <laughs> they grew up kind of saying that he was both which is you know mm. obviously funny and means you're neither yeah no okay that's no and you know what is interesting because uh, i think also where you grow up with where you grow or rather uh it, it's it depends on the diaspora community i used i i used to um kind of just box everybody as just being diaspora and then people who are born in ethiopia but that's not the case i find that even communities for example in australia are a lot more intertwined with their ethnic consciousness mm. uh, in certain communities in europe and, and, and in australia as opposed to like canada or uh, uh or the united states and and uh and elsewhere so that's what i found but um in terms of me personally i I used to be very fluent in Amharic, but basically when I when I grew up here, when I moved to, to to North America, I had a lot of problems speaking English. I had a lot of problems assimilating when and turning the language. So uh, my my uh, my teachers basically told my parents that I I, I wasn't to speak Amharic anymore. Wow. And, and so basically, since kindergarten up until high school, I didn't speak any lick of Amharic. I didn't speak any. Amharic. I I listened to it, but I didn't mm -hmm. speak it there I gradually lost it it wasn't until um I got into uh high like I graduated high school where I started feeling very self-conscious because I couldn't respond to my relatives when they would speak to me in Amharic or I and I want that was the time where I was very I wanted to connect more than ever to my culture so I was from there that I basically basically forced my parents or my family to speak to me in Amharic and that's where I basically learned it from but um you know, I think even it's a generational thing. Um, I've seen growing up people who are in my age group, people who were either born or raised in, in, in North America, they didn't grow up speaking it like that. Uh, some of them did, but not as much. And then after the generation after me, uh, it was more fashionable, even more than ever, to speak to their kids in English, only English. Not because they had to, but because it was seen as like, Siltani, you know, it was mm -hmm. seen as more civilized their parents and they would, they would speak to their kids in these in broken English and their kids wouldn't even be able to understand Amharic at all. People usually who are born and raised in Ethiopia or, or in America, they might not be able to speak Amharic, but they can still understand it. And I've seen a lot of kids don't even understand Amharic or anything. They, they can't even respond, let alone um, talk in it. So I, I find a, a generational thing. But I've also known now other, a lot of people who are very um, eager and a lot of people who are um, upset at their family for not speaking to them, for not talking to them in their local language. It doesn't have to be Amharic or any, any other languages, of course. But yeah, it's a, I think it's like a, a case of like, um, I want to be hip. I want to, I want to assimilate. So I'm not, so I'm not going to teach it to my kids. And mm -hmm. then those feel self conscious. And then those family members get mad at their kids for not being able to understand it. It's like, what? what it's a vicious else? cycle. Yeah, that, that is a vicious cycle right there that, is kind of self-perpetuated the way you you um, put it. I yeah, I find a lot of the ones in LA. I would say most of them, I kind of see it as one directional. They I call it like Amharic commands, you know, like Kuchbel Tenes Bila Tata Barun Kifat Zimbel Rimotu Taling. Like they understand all those commands, but there's no it, none of those things require a response. It's not like how was your day. You know, philosophize to me on the different t forms of governance in Ethiopia. No, it's it's not, it's it's none of that. It's all one way commands, and they know how to just like have an accompanying action in response to that command, but not how to actually have like a a flowing conversation. And then there are some like that you described that have just not a lick at all, which surprises me. If they at least have another language, I don't mind. But it's a very um, surprising i should honestly be the last person both of my parents went to british schools and they came here in the 70s you know i really should be the last person that speak on heart and then you know i'm the first person to speak on heart uh, so it's like you said it's it's about the effort that you put in and the situation you put around and my dad was pretty forceful about not letting me respond in english so from a young age that 
it uh it hurt my grades in english from like kindergarten to first grade but it, it helped me in the long run it definitely does help you in the long run yeah exactly it's about effort it's about the effort it's about um the willingness to to learn about it and, and to make the effort because um i personally i don't blame people for not being able to speak or or or, or listen to mark because at the end of the day where else are you going to learn it from other than your parents mm -hmm. you know so and, and speaking a language is a lot more difficult for than a lot of people realize for some people it want to be easier for for other people like myself growing up it was very it's very difficult to learn new languages so um you know and people will start to feel feel self-conscious because uh, when they respond, they might have an accent in English or whatever accent when they respond. And then when people make fun of them, they just start to shut down. I was like that, you know, in the past. But when you, the more comfortable you are speaking it, the more, you know, the, the more you'll be able to be fluent and the more you'll be able to actually go back and forth and have a conversation with people. I'm very lucky that I was able to um, not just speak, but even learn to read and write them hard yes. as well. It was uh, it was a big help for me, especially when it comes to learning about history and, and politics. It is a, it's a, it is a must. But even in general, I think it's it's a good way for you to start to practice and you speak to people. You speak you just just speak it to other people, and you get more comfortable. That's what I found. Yeah, um, I, I I think you and I may have this rare trait, um, and I, I think this from a number of things, but particularly about what you're saying right now of disagreeableness. And I think I think especially in diaspora, even though there are different and diverse diasporas, it takes a certain amount of disagreeableness to get through people making fun of you. And for me, it was like actual ill and spite, like I'm going to be better at Amharic than my parents and all my aunts and uncles. And uh, I don't know if I got there, but I, I got pretty close and uh, some of them definitely feel it. And so sometimes we'll talk now and I'll speak to them in Amharic. They find themselves responding in English and then they apologize and start speaking in Amharic. And I'm like, you can speak in English if you want. And it, it's almost like a taunt, you know, like it, yeah. they knew where I used to be. And um, it got to the point recently I was at a funeral and one of my dad's best friends came up to me and he had said this thing to me a few years ago and then he repeated it. He was like, you don't just speak Amharic. He's like, you speak like a rural Amharic speaker. He's like, that's weird. That doesn't that make sense. sense. Compliments of compliments. <laughs> yeah, and I told him, I was like, look who I've been hanging around with, dude. I've been hanging around with monks for 10 years and look where all the monks are from that I've been hanging out with. So um, that was not on purpose. It wasn't like me doing an effect, you know? It, it was like a natural kind of osmosis. But you, you, um, you you brought up a very interesting point earlier when we we're talking about ethnicity and commerce that i wanted to come back to so it's funny you kind of casually went into this the stereotype of the gurage is that they're into commerce but you kind of just stated it as a fact so is this a stereotype or is there is there some uh you know uh general tendency that it's fair to say uh, about that because that that's like the thing that they say actually our bishop a, a year or two ago, Abu Nabar Nawaz, I don't know if you know him, of Southern California, there's a couple times where he got into a digression in the middle of a preaching, and sometimes he enters politics. And on a couple of those occasions, he randomly said that Gurage is actually the best ethnicity. And uh, spoiler alert, it's not his ethnicity. He's like, all they care about is peace and prosperity and not the prosperity in the political sense. No, um, it's, it is a stereotype, but it's also true. Both both sides of my family are both into Nikta. So it's really, yeah, it, it's, um, but it, it has historical uh, precedent. Um, a lot of the times when, you know, historically when Guragis wanted to, to migrate, you know, a lot of their land was, was devastated. So they had to migrate to other places in order to, you know, make a living for themselves and to be invested. And, you know, there are character traits, of course, that are associated with every ethnicity, Guragi, Amara, Tigre, Ormo, some negative some positive of course and i guess this would be seen as it was seen as both positive and negative uh because traditionally you know um commerce and, and uh you know going into those businesses is it wasn't traditionally seen as a very uh highly looked on profession so there was of course negative stereotypes but it wasn't really anything deep um Especially at Disaba, part of the reason why there's so many people who are living, who I guess are living at Disaba is because of commerce, because of the relative proximity for the, of the land towards Disaba, of course. Um, and I think that also has had direct cultural implications uh, on the people itself. 
uh, in terms of uh, keeping the culture, uh, being uh, wary of assimilation. I'm putting assimilation here in, in air quotes because a lot of there, a lot of people, you know, like I mentioned earlier, there is this perception that Gragis don't are not proud of their culture, are not proud of their identity. There is this whole they want to be another ethnic group thing. I'm not going to bother to repeat, but that's not the case. That's really not the case. It's more so of what's seen as profitable. Um, I, I would ask even my family, but why didn't you live in a Guraking Arastamarachu? Their mentors is like, it's like they see it as something, like they see learning the language as something you have to gain something out of. Learning the language isn't something you gain out of. You have to do things that you, you will later profit off of. So learning Amharic was because Amharic is a lingua franca that you speak, you speak to everybody from people from multiple different backgrounds. That was a must for people to be able to live off of these, you know, these, uh, these professions. So in terms of that is absolutely true that almost, I don't know a single Guraki who doesn't have a family member that isn't involved in business or, or market or trade or any of that kind of stuff. But because of that, it's because of that, that they have been, Know, relatively well known, even if their numbers, you know, don't reflect that. Yeah, I I think it's fascinating what you're saying about this desire to assimilate, whether we put it in scare quotes or not. I heard this former TPLF uh, fighter, who you know he detracted from them. He said that before he was propagandized by that group in the first place, that any educated Tigrayan, and he was from Aksum, wanted to use Amharic because it was the lingua franca, the same way that you said. And he said, look, the alphabet is the same, and there were no laws and no people preventing me, for example, from writing a letter to people. And yet, he says, not only did he never write a letter in Tigrinya or write anything in Tigrinya, everything he wrote was in Amharic, he said that the only way he could tell the difference between the Eritreans and the Tigrayans was that the Eritreans were writing in Tigrinya. And then he, he and his friends thought it was funny that that was happening. Um, I had been curious about kind of how far back writing in other languages or cultures or ethnicities in Ethiopia goes. And I really don't find things of strong evidence before the 1800s in other languages. And they seem to be prompted by colonial powers like the Swedish and the Italian. From what you know, could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the Gurage and then if there was any writing involved with this commerce? I'm assuming now if there was, it would be in Amharic, not in Guraginya. But like even this basic story that we hear that they are from this place called Gura. Like we I think you and I were having this conversation about the word gay, which you know could be like house or city in different languages or dialects on the the kind of spectrum of the Sabatbet Gurage to to Sodbo to Adarinya or Gesinan and all that, but like this idea of Gurage being from this place called Gura, which still exists in Eritrea, and then any sort of uh, ideas you've ever heard, if you've ever heard of them using writing. To answer your first question, um, I think we have to understand about what. Uh, what is understood as, as the written language of Ethiopia at that time and what, who is really connected with. Um, when a lot of people might not understand, I'm sure you already know that secular didn't, education didn't even technically start in Ethiopia until the early 20th century. You know, so most of the, most of the, most of writings, historical writings and everything that was found was written in either Giz or in Amharic. It was written in Giz because that's, you know, that was the, that was the religious writing. That was, a, uh, that's the, writing of the church but also it was the it was the it was basically the written language of ethiopia even up until the emperor the age of azay Tudros. Uh, but amharic as the lingua franca of the country since the time of amlak amharic was also written down as the as a royal language the lisani nigus uh, but there was no writings of any other languages in Ethiopia, as, uh, as uh, with the exception of um, Gesena or Hararinya. Uh, no other languages written, neither in Cushitic or Semitic or, or any of the other languages. And uh, like you said, I, I was I was trying to find out, I was trying to inquire more about even in terms of the historical evidence or academic, you know, findings of, of Tigrinya, written Tigrinya uh, that were found, but they're 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 pretty sparse and there's still a debate about when exactly the first you know writings were found 
Um, but it reflects about that in, in, in terms of Gurakin, because there's no, Gurakin was never written down. The first the first written text of Gurakin was written in uh, a book in Chahanya in uh, the 1970s, the 1960s. Wow. Um, but uh, it wasn't really seen, it wasn't really written down. Actually, uh, it actually goes into your second question in terms of the ethnogenesis of the people. Uh, much of what is understood about the Guragi history is not written down by Guragis, but it was written mm -hmm. down in either two different sources. It's written down in either um, the royal chronicles of the emperor, the emperors, the Zain and Moal, uh, as well as the religious hagiographies of certain saints, uh, such as the Gedla, Gedla Tekla Hemanot, Gedla Zaina Marcos, uh, and uh, and so on, and also you know Arabic writings and then. Later, you have foreign writings that talk about that mention Guragis, but as a far as as a local written source, there wasn't really any of that down. What's been traditionally um, preserved are oral traditions. Oral tradition is a huge part of the history, of not just Guragi, but everywhere else in in southern and western Ethiopia. Of course, it's tricky when you know confirming um, oral history is very tricky, if you, especially if you don't have any empirical evidence of that, but the oral history is still very strongly embedded within the identity of uh, the Guraki people. Uh, that's the most I'm knowledgeable about uh, in, in there. And there is, um, there is, uh, I was also debating, because that's very popular folk, that's a very popular folklore about, you know, Guraki Malif Kaguragi, that is, you know, see, that's very popular. Uh, I believe it was first popularized by uh, Alec Atayi in mm. the early 20th century. And uh, it's also actually orally preserved. It does, there is agreements with that in, in Kuragi history. But like I said, because there's no written, there's no written evidence about that. It's just a local, it's an orally, um, it's, a, it's a preserved or, oral history. But from my understanding, from my, I was, I went back to Ethiopia and I asked a lot of people, I asked a lot of uh, both educated uh, historians as well as uh, Tariq, you know, Shamagri, because they, they preserve a lot of the history there. Um, generally, what is understood is that uh, it isn't Guragi uh, Mala doesn't necessarily mean Kaguragi Mata Sayon, Kagira, Kagira, the people on the left, uh, what it means is particularly because the Guragi traditionally lived in an area that was uh, located west of the then the political capital of the area, which was Shawa. Or for example, Tagulat Debra that was the capital of the area at the time. They basically ascribed Guraki people as the related people, as the people on the left of us, Basta Jira, Basta Basta Gira. So that's what I understood as the as the understanding. But there is also um, traditions about uh, migrations from all much of other uh, places. Uh, I don't want to go. Uh, I, I'm sure you have other questions, but I will say that Guragi history and Guragi identity. It's definitely, um, I basically circled around a history of migrations from multiple different areas. Uh, migrations from Eritrea, migrations from Gwanda, migrations from Shawa, migrations from Harar, migrations from a bunch of different places. Uh, and they conglomerate what is known as the Guraki people in general. And the migration, Kagura, the Azmaj Sawat's migration from Gura was the first of these migrations. That's why it's preserved. That's why it's the most popularly preserved. But his migration was not the only migration into the Guragi area, nor nor does it mean that uh, Guragis didn't exist before them because there's a multitude of many old churches or many old monasteries that predate Azamaj Sawat's expedition to the Guragi area. But we, yeah, we can definitely get into that for sure. Later. Yeah, that, that's what uh, fascinates me because, yeah, the story I heard was basically the fall of the Aksumite Empire so thinking somewhere around the year 900 to 1000 in in the midst of that and and related to that because you brought up monasteries there was something very interesting too i was going back and and reading a really uh, old book from the 90s graham hancock's the sign and the seal and there's a funny scene where he has an interpreter and he's at the zuai monastery south of addis ababa where i've had several friends uh, the archbishop i mentioned earlier the famous abuna gorgorios as well and and several friends of mine who have actually studied at that monastery. And um, he he meets the kind of local people who say that they have been there. And at one point, 
the Tawot, which he was seeking, or the Ark of the Covenant, was brought there. And they said that they came from Tigray. Their own story was these people of Zuai came from Tigray at the certain time. And because the Amharic interpreter didn't know what language they were, he was calling them Tigrayans and sp saying that they spoke Tigrinya. It was a little suspicious to me, and it seemed off, because again, the records don't show you know, Tigrinya in the 900s. And so I was like, uh, I don't know about that. And then through talking to you, you were telling me a little bit about these people and their kind of um, their adjacency to the Gurage. So could you could you talk about those people of Zuai, their language, and then I guess like the whole like Sabat bit and and what like what are the connections between some of these languages, right? Because usually they have the northern uh, Ethiosemitic or or yeah Ethiosemitic yeah. languages that they kind of batch together, but Guraginya is in a different kind of uh, uh, sub branch. Yes. Um, I basically, I'll, let me start off with saying that uh, a lot of people don't know this, uh, but uh, Guragi has, has, there's a multitude of different uh, linguistic groups within the Guragi itself, uh, some more controversial than others. I would basically classify them in three groups. You have the Northern group, uh, the Western group, and then the Eastern group. Um, the Northern group, uh, consist of Sodo or Kistaninya is the preferred term. Uh, the language called Kistaninya, you have Dobi or Dobinya. Um, you also have the Western Gragi, which is the Sawatbeit, uh, which is uh, itself consisted of seven different subgroups, which is where the term Sawatbeit comes from. And then you have the Eastern group, which is where um, formerly the Sinta used to belong to before they identified as their own ethnic group, as well as the Waleni, and sometimes even the Zay was considered uh, Eastern Gragi. Um, some, I think some of the, the classifications of these groupings are um, it's more controversial. They're still not really uh, um, completely, it's not settled about the, this debate isn't really 100% settled, but that's basically where it is. Um, but it isn't language, it isn't just language that, that uh, these groupings are based off of, but also in terms of um, political organization, in terms of culture, but particularly in religion. Um, so the reason I say this is because some of the histories of the other groups, these, these geographical groups, and I talk about the North, the West, and the East, they have their own, um, they have, they're, they're culturally all related. I still consider them all Gragi with, with the exception of the Sinte and Zay. I don't, I don't believe that they consider themselves Gragi, but they do have a connection with the Gragi, of course. Um, but there's also religion. Um, for example, much of the, the Western Gragi, uh, was not all of it, but much of it had its own practice, its own form of uh, animism. Mm -hmm. Up until um, Emperor Minilik Sam, Emperor, the, the mid 19th century, basically around that time, many of them, not all of them, but many of them were practicing animistic beliefs. Uh, this is in contrast towards the, the Northern Guragi, the, for example, the Kastani, uh, which is literally Christian, but immediately it means Christian, who are Christian for mid, or maybe perhaps more than like a thousand years. Uh, likewise, there's a similar contrast within the Eastern Guragi, which is the Sinte, uh, I'm not, again, I'm not saying the Guragi, but uh, the Sinte Waleni, who have been known for being Muslim for also for a very, very long time. And it's very quite tied in to their ethnicity, their identity, their, their identity, their ethnic makeup is very tied in with religion. So there's a lot of different varieties about these, um, th these things. Um, in terms of the Zay, uh, it's very, uh, the Zay in itself, even though their language is, is close to like the Sinte and the Waleni language, they are uh, Christianity is a very big part of their identity because, like you said, the, the, there is a legend of that comes about uh, that talks about how when Gudits ravaged Aksum, a lot of the people from Aksum or who came from that area migrated to Lake Zuai and they traveled there. They they escaped there for safekeeping. Tawut and Izot, they they preserve their identity. But like the Gurage, they also have a, a lot of history that talks about migrations from other places that people, other people who migrated to uh, the Zuai area for safekeeping, uh, to to preserve their identity, to, for, or for basically for safety in general. Um, even the time of the Hamidagrang, there were a lot of people who uh, came from the Amara areas or people from the Gurage area, people from the other areas who also moved to the Zuai area and they assimilated into the Zai mm -hmm. culture. There was also the other way around where a lot of people from Zuai also migrated into the Guragi area. I give you an example. My maternal clan, my grandmother's maternal clan is said to have come from Zuai. She used to say that they're known for have saying, look, Enyantin, Enyaka Zuai. 
እኛ ከአባቶቻችን እንትን እንደዚህ ታቡት ይዞ ከዟይ ታቡት ይዞ ታቡትን ሸክሞ they settled into the ground here from our clan so they there's a lot of traditions that are connected within the Guragi and the Zai, their languages are similar, but also even in terms of the ethnogenesis of the people, because they also say that they also came from the north, similar to the way that the Guragis also say that they came from the north, and even the clans, there are a lot of clans that they share with each other, so there's a lot of similarities with them in that aspect. Uh, but it's very interesting because I didn't know about any of this, <laughs> especially in terms of lineages, in terms of clans, I didn't know any of this until I went back to Ethiopia last year. Wow. Um, Sure. It is very, very preserved. There is a lot of um, orally preserved traditions about the ethnogenesis of you know, these agnatic patri lineages uh, from multiple different areas that come from multiple different areas, and it ties in within their identity. Um, I didn't know about any of this. I wasn't told about any of this. I, I learned it when I went back there. Uh, but there's also kind of there's there's some books that talk about it, of course. But yeah, like it's it's very interesting to to learn about. I I, I find it very fascinating, not just in terms of my own personal discovery, because but because of the connections that these have, mm -hmm. um, because of the fact that the Guraike history and Guraike culture and the Zai and also probably other groups, um, they claim they 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 have they are very consciously uh, aware about. Their, their traditions about them coming from other places. And it's interesting because that, that kind of proves that there is a connection that they own themselves preserve, that they have a connection with other parts of Ethiopia. And it's interesting because a lot of discourse, political discourse around Ethiopian history has always been Ethiopia, you know, kind of thing, you know, where it's like, oh, a lot of groups, yeah. a lot of these groups, uh, only only Ethiopians, only uh, Amharas were Ethiopia, only Amhara and Tigray were, were Ethiopia proper. Everybody else was forced to be um, Ethiopia. And that's not the case because not just in Guragi, but even other so-called Cushitic groups, such as the, the Kafa, uh, the Walaita, the, the Yemsa, a lot of these groups also have clans, their their clans and their, um, their royal lineages also claim to have come from Tigray. You know the the Walaita lineage also claims to have came from Tigray. You have the Kafa lineage, the the Kambata. They also came to have, uh, claim to have came from Mans. So there are traditions that exist within many of these different ethnic groups within the southern and the western parts of Ethiopia that themselves say that we have a connection. Our ancestry comes from these different groups. But you have you know these these falsities being depicted as if. You know these groups have nothing to be to do with Ethiopia. They were colonized. They were forced to become Abyssinia and all that kind of stuff. Where it's like you clearly don't know what these people say. You don't know what they're. Doing. Yeah, it's a clear agenda to Balkanize, to Yugoslavize, to you know, oh, eighty-seven languages, eighty-seven countries. How about that? Like that's the a clear agenda to divide and conquer, and to not have uh, a strong foothold there, which of course would mean that we have. Um, some sort of impact on what goes on in the greater Red Sea area, which is something they really, really, really don't want because of the commerce and, and war that uh, mainly the U.S., but also their kind of satellite states have been interested in, in demoralizing and sabotaging. I, I always found it fascinating, and I stand by this claim, that, you know, something in British intel must have been afraid of Ethiopia. I really stand by that because if it wasn't the case, the Napier expedition against Emperor Theodros, um, they could have made it bigger. They could have turned it into a colony, but you know, yeah. it was in and out. It was vengeful. It was punitive. It was with the help of local people, and uh, it wasn't a full-blown thing. But it was subtle, and even if you see, you know, the hand the British and the French had with uh, Ligiasu, like you see this kind of like very subtle breaking down. I think of Ethiopian society that ends in in the coup of of the 60s and then the coup of the 70s and uh, of course the coups that continued um, after that. I, I want to focus in on especially this politics and religion points that you're uh, saying. But first, I wanted to get back to kind of your your personal story, which helps uh, weave the pattern of the larger story. So your parents, you said, only really spoke the lingua franca, which is Amharic. Does that have to do with them being a part of different clans? And again, this kind of uh, people painting the Gurage with this broad stripe as if Gurage is just one you know, blob or one thing. Did they come from different clans that had 
different dialects of of Guraginya, of what would be called Guraginya, and you know, were they intelligible at all? Like your mom's family and and your dad's family, were they speaking unintelligible dialects? Is that part of it or no? No. Um, well, me, my Guragi side comes from two groups. Uh, my my maternal side, my mom's side is Kastani, uh, Kastaniya, uh, we speak Kastaniya, and then my paternal side, Yabatim, Zamet Minami, do Pinacha. So uh, generally, they're both part of the Northern Guragi group. So um, they're they're fairly intelligible with each other. So communication was never really an issue. Um, I wouldn't even call these clans. When I specifically talk about clans, I'm talking about agnatic patri lineages. You know, they don't probably number more than a hundred people. You know, there are hundreds of different clans throughout the Guragi. Uh, Guragi. There are different subgroups. You know, uh, basically how it goes is you have Guragi, and then you have the subgroup. You have Sabatwe, Soto, Dopi, Mescan, etc. And then you have uh, it goes deeper into like uh, I would say territory. It goes into territory. Or it goes into lineage and then it goes into sub lineage and it goes and vice versa and it, it, it keeps going different it keeps going deeper uh but the way that it functions the way that the social structure functions is it differs throughout the different groups for example the sabbat uh in the states of the sabbat they're known for prioritizing uh clan based clan based lineages that's seen as a more of a um, that's seen as more of an identifier within the the Sabatvi culture. In the case of the Kastani or the Northern Guragi, territoriality is, is seen more as a, a form of social function. People identify more by their territory, by their geographic area, uh, which I, is actually similar to the way that um, the Amharas are, you know. Uh, I always find that it's, it's there's contrast between the Guragi and like the Northern, the Amara and the Tigray, where you don't really have clans, you don't really have these lineage-based things in, in, in the society, in Amhara society or Tigri society uh, as much at all, uh, but they are very different in Guragi where these are very much preserved, they're very much um, existent. There's still the there's still the groups that are based off of these clans, these clans. I'm saying clans um, because I don't know if there's a- there's a, a better, better word. Yeah, yeah. but I would, it, 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 the basic is called Tzib or Gosa, you would call them Gosa. We could call them Gosa or Tib and Gragging are called Tib. So these exist, but even then, I didn't know about my you know Gosa. So that I I when that's when I went to ask is when I found out. But even my my they don't really know much about it. But um, in terms of uh, these migrations, they still all identify as Guragi. Like they say, we came from this area, but they still there's no elements of them coming from whatever other groups. You know. They still all speak the same language. If they come from that same subgroup, they all do. Uh, one clan can be found in one subgroup, but they can also be found in another subgroup. You know, some some clans can be found in multiple different subgroups, even if uh, those clans don't necessarily speak to each other. I'll give you an example. There is a group called um, Timurti. There is a called uh, there's a clan called Timurti, or um, yeah, we'll, we'll say Timurti or Fasilgi. I'll, I'll give you Fasilgi. Fasilge is a known clan within um, the Kistani area. Uh, Fasilge basically, like I remember how we, we were talking about gay, the mm -hmm. term the term where it says Fasilge comes from means basically the house of Fasil, because there was the, one of the, there was uh, one of Ate uh, uh, Zarayakob's sons was called Fasilidas. So from it was basically called the Enya Ye Fasil Zarnan, Enya Ke Fasil so basically they say that they migrated to the Guragi area but that fasil gate clan can also be found in for example Muhr, which is another subgroup the languages are different but the clan is known for migrating throughout different areas so Guragi, like i said it's a conglomerate of different clans and different migrations from multiple different areas but the material culture the societal culture the language is generally uh depending on the subgroup it's generally the same there's no real differentiation in terms of the migrations from the different areas because they assimilated. They assimilated into the existing culture, the pre-existing culture. So that's where I've gathered that from. Um, I, for example, if there was another clan that said, um, there's another clan that's um, claimed from uh, Tekla Medin. Tekla Medin is known for uh, to, to come from Aksum. So mm -hmm. people in Tekla Medin clan, they speak Kastani just like us. We, there's no problem. There's no custom there's no cultural differentiation between the two it's just more of 
ancestry. Yeah, it's a particular Yakov. famous ancestor that they're all conscious of and aware of. Yes. Yeah, that that's interesting. And what you said about the Amhara mostly not having it, I hear that from a lot of people too. And it's true um, on half my family. So my mother's mother and my father's father, they don't have anything like that. And they're both from different uh, parts of Shah, from Taran, from Minjar. However, my dad's mom and then my mom's dad, they kind of do. So my mom's dad, because of the connection to the Solomonic dynasty that he has, they're kind of aware of that clan and that lineage. And and they uh, surprisingly keep in touch uh, with a lot of these people. Like I was surprised how well, even in the diaspora, they, they like know each other. Uh, right. Like some of them will have a common ancestor, like you said, like, one of the ones, for example, is Ras Gabri of Simin, who's a, a similar ancestor with Taitu. And, uh, you know, he has hundreds of descendants in the United States that I could tell you, and they are in contact with each other. Like, that's it's a very funny thing that I learned about just a couple of years ago. And I was like, oh, you guys like, oh, you talk. And then my, my dad's mom, uh, she's a, a priest's daughter. And um, it's important because I, I got this... Uh, hundreds of years old Psalms of David or Mazmura Dawit from her, that she was one of those very few literate people. You and I were talking about literacy earlier. She was one of the very few elite uh, literate people. And it's because she came from this household of clerics. And she actually uh, did her Dawit better than a lot of her her uh, brothers and cousins, some of whom were alaka, uh, you know, which is a, like a, a pretty prestigious title in the, in the church for a priest to have, a married priest to have. And, uh, but a lot of her cousins were members of the, and herself are a member of the Adiske clan. So she made a whole book about all about, the members of that. Yes, I was about to say, yeah. Do you know you know the Adiske? Adiske, and I was going to bring that up to you because I'm familiar. I was talking with Lich Tedla and, and other mm -hmm. people about these clans. Uh, Adiske, Sofani, yes. Berneguske, uh, even Moja, I know as a, as, a, as a clan that, exist I, I believe the Germani brothers uh Germani actually came yeah. from the Mort clan and I believe that they're associated with the aristocracy royal aristocracies but from what I understand these clans only exist within Shawan. I don't mm -hmm. think they exist in the other Amara parts and I always found that interesting. But even the term even gay even itself I'm like okay so we have gay here gay isn't Amharic or nor is it gay is as far as understanding so where did this it, it, it might be it might be good because we have words like the word um originally is has and um so the the ha turns into an e and the sa turns into a ch and so has is the same uh root that is related to words like mahisan or womb and chonya uh, or your betrothed to your you know your fiance um and uh i said i said my son already there's there's others there his son it's also related to the word his son which is infant and so um the has ege is the one in proximity to the emperor so the has is the as is the emperor so the chage or the head abbot of the debrilibanos monastery in shoa is called the has ege so i think it is good but i wonder if it's used differently because in there a house or city of the emperor wouldn't quite make sense, but something uh, in proximity. We have even in Amharic, I don't know if you know the words, like my grandma from Shoa would always say, which means like the thing that is next to where my feet rest on the bed and the thing that is next to where my head rests on the bed. But uh, so I understand the word gay in Amharic and in Giz as like at agav or vicinity. But I don't, I don't know how that interacts with how it is in the other Ethiopian Semitic languages. I always assumed that gay was is at first. I did I believe that it was is in the past, um, especially because even in Ante uh, Ante Amdetion's chronicles, he specifically mentions Gragi comes is 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 from the way that it was written it was is it wasn't the Gragi term, but it was more so the emperor or the royal chronicles interpretation of it you have Gragi and Siltege they, they, he, he wrote both of these groups down as gay so I assumed that it was gay is at first before I was told that it wasn't gay is or it wasn't it's not seen in biblical gay is or what is seen in mm -hmm. gay is right now yeah 
I was always curious of where did this term gay come from? It's not even because I know that even the term harar gay comes mm -hmm. from that, you know, it comes from that other name as well. So I was always very curious to find it. And you know, even in that thread that I made even when I went um, on, on Twitter, I was I was um kind of shocked to find out that even gay isn't even a universal term throughout the Quraggis. It's only specifically used in, in Kistaninya. Uh, it's. I mean, it differs that the yeah. the cognate exists because it's in in Kistani houses seen as gay, but in other places it's gang. It's gang. Yeah. Shout gang. out to our 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 friend uh, Dawit Spielman, who's a friend of the program. He's been on a couple times, and his family is in Degang. And so, is in Degang is are they in the west, east, or north? They're the west. They're peripheral. So they're they're not just west. They're the west. They're the western to west. So. Um, it's uh, I, I always I was trying to have a discussion about it because he's very educated. He's very knowledgeable about these things. He was actually one of the first people to tell me about the existence of Amara clans within the Gurage people um, and the fact that they're still identified as Amara. I didn't I didn't even know about this. He was the one who brought that up to me, which I found fascinating. Yeah. And I was I was supposed to have a discussion about this. And I, I, um, I we kind of fell off from there, but um, I forgot about it. But. I, I did want to go into that with him, of course, and even from that, it was it's it's interesting because the way that the term gay functions, it's it it serves it it's uh it's used as uh, both a meaning for house, but it's also used as a tit, uh, as a titular kind of uh, identity for the names of clans, Fasil gay, Amara gay, Abesh gay, uh, Timur gay. You know, all these kinds of things are very familiar within the Kistani. But not so much in the other Iraqi subgroups, as far as I'm aware of. I'm still very, I'm still very unfamiliar about the histories of these other groups because there's so much to unpack about these the histories of these other. It's very diverse. So I'm trying, even myself, I'm not as familiar with my own subgroups, my maternal side. I'm not as familiar about that than I am from my other side. Yeah, it's fascinating the way you are saying it. I think it's possible, uh, especially like. I'd have to read through all the Garima Gospels, uh, you know, but I've had a friend who actually has had access to them, blessed. If I ever go to the Garima Gadam, maybe I will. But um, you see like G is over time and G is in different places. And this is one of the ideas and concepts that uh, Professor Gedacho Haile of blessed memory really kind of imparted in me by talking to him a little bit and then reading his writings is that um, sometimes uh, in Amharic, there's a, a, a thing, a harsh T, harsh S thing, where uh, we take a G's word, for example, the famous lake is Sana, and then we pronounce it Tana. Yes. Uh, the city, the port city in Eritrea, Masawa, which a lot of, because of the Turks and Italians, people say Masawa, which is crazy to me. But uh, you see some Amharic maps, and, and even some Amharic speakers hey, cracks you. me up. Mutawa, yeah, Mutawa. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, like yeah, and 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 at the same time, he says though, mm -hmm. sometimes there's an overcorrection where it's incorrect. So, for example, I hear some people say "tabai," where the original "guz" word is actually "tabai." So oh. there's sometimes where people overcorrect, thinking that it's only in one direction, mm -hmm. and it shows. He says a lot of times, like when he wrote about Dakika Stefanos or the Stephanites, he he said one of the signs that they were from uh, recruited from a very diverse area, even though they were kind of uh, in the northeast corner of Tigray originally, they were the recruits of the monks were from all over Ethiopia, going to your point about how it was not ethnic based and people were pulled from everywhere in the empire, said one of the signs was how bad their giz was. And you see the different kind of spelling mistakes that they make. And some of the, com there's some commonalities in the spelling mistakes that give you clues and hints as to what the original language is. So now you're making me wonder if even in Amharic with the rasge, girge, and in giz with the chagge, which comes from hasege, mm -hmm. um, it might be a thing where the South Ethiosemitic languages impacted giz. It's very possible that 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 later giz chronicles, as you said, there were chronicles written until the chronicle of Emperor Theodros uh, in the 1800s that were written in giz. And yeah. by this time, the vernacular Giz had long been gone, but people continued to write in it the same way Latin was in Europe. So it's very possible that this interwoven story, contrary to the story that the southern peoples of Ethiopia have no kind of part in the history, we may have just stumbled onto a fact that maybe the Gurage spectrum of languages or conglomerate, I like a, the word conglomerate is a business term or commerce term. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. The conglomerate. 
<laughs> yeah, it may have had an impact linguistically upon the later uh, uh, chronicles, which, which, and and it leads me to to this like religious idea as well. Again, I didn't know about this uh, ethnicity and and all this stuff until much later, but I later came to found out. Uh, you know, I grew up Orthodox, but my godfather, funny enough, is a, and this is just, you know diaspora things. He's Catholic. And um, most of the, the Catholic Ethiopians I have met in my life through him and through others just happened to also be Guragi. And so in my head, I was like, I guess there must have been a bunch of people there. Like I've come to find out there's an area called Saganeti in Eritrea where there happened to be a lot of Catholics. I don't know what kind of Catholic mission happened there, but I assume there was something like that. And um, well, I've heard same. very positive things. There's, uh, the a, there's, a, Catholics. In Chaha, there's a place in Imdir, uh, in Chaha, there is a large Catholic community in, in a specific place called Chaha, the Salafit. So there is, there's a large uh, Catholic population there. So that's probably where they come from. That's what, I, and, and I was going to ask you about that. Uh, and, and what I appreciate is what I've heard of the current, at least Catholic bishop there, is that he's been really making everything look Orthodox. Uh, and and even some people are butthurt about it, but he does it, you know, to their chagrin anyway. But uh, what is like the makeup? Because then later, even later, after I found out about how many Catholic Guragues there were, and most of the other ones I met were Orthodox, people started telling me like Gurage, which are Muslim, and that's most of them. And I have met one or two uh, Guragues who are Muslim. So I just anecdotally haven't met that many. Is there anything that you know about statistically, like the religious makeup of the Guragi? Are they majority Orthodox, Muslim, Catholic? What? What? Um, well, like I mentioned earlier, even based on the subgroups, the religion sort of differs. The religious makeup differs. Uh, you have throughout the East is predominantly almost like 100% Muslim. The North, the Kistani, the Dubi, they're almost 100% Orthodox Christian. They have been for a long time. In the case of the Sabbath faith, it's basically split, I would say, between Christian and Muslim. I would say the population is pretty much even. But like I said, even the, the religious makeup and the history back then is is different because a lot of them didn't get ex well, like I said, exposed because there is an early history of both Islam and Christianity within all of Guragi. But a lot of them basically uh, ended up reverting to animistic beliefs because they were split from the, the, Christian, the Christian kingdom. Uh, mm -hmm. by the Amir Grand invasions and then the subsequent Oromo invasions after that. So because of that, of course, a lot of them reverted. But I will say that um, personally, there is a lot of, there's a there's a long history of both Islam and Christianity, like I mentioned. I think even in the, if you're familiar with the, the Gidlet uh, Zena Marcos, the, the Gidlet Zena Marcos specifically talks about how he evangelized the people of Mohar. The Mohar are part of the Sabbath faith, but unlike the other part, people of the Sabbath faith, they're known for being Orthodox Christians for a very long time. And still, they're still Orthodox Christians today because he they, he is known for have built, uh, he built, there is a Gadam, very famous Gadam called uh, a Yesus, Muhari Yesus. So he was known for have built Muhari Yesus. Uh, in the case of Kistani, uh, the patron saint of Kistani is, is a government fiscundus, Abuna government fiscundus. Even hit today, he built uh, he built two churches. One is in Zikwala, Zikwala Apo, and he also built another one called Mitrakab Apo. So he built these around the, the 12th, the 13th century. And he, even today, he's buried in Mitrakab Apo in the Kistani area, the Sodugwaki area. Today, his grave is still there. So there's a, a lot of the Tekla, even Kedus Tekla Hemanot is known for evangelizing a lot of the Guragi as well. So there are a lot of saints that are intertwined without certain areas in the Guragi and are known for introducing or evangelizing Christianity. But like I said, subsequent events, historical events caused, it, caused a lot of them to split and caused a lot of them to kind of revert to different beliefs, not just in Guragi, but even in Kambata, in, in the case of Yemsa, a lot of the... Um, What's their name? Inaria were known for have been being Christian for a very long time until they were split from the mainland and they weren't able to consecrate bishops. They weren't allowed to bring, you know, Papata. They weren't allowed to, they weren't able to bring that. So they the Christianity died or, uh, from there. But also because there was also um, the Ahmed Grang invasions were known for have um, forcefully converting a lot of um, people towards uh, Islam at the time. Uh, as well as even even the churches that I went to, um, they showed me a lot of the remains of certain churches uh, uh, of my of 
places in, in where I was visiting and they showed me that they were burnt because of Ahmed Gang, a lot of tables were burnt by him. Uh, but it wasn't just him. Even in terms of um, uh, during the rebellions of, um, uh, during when Minili came to the Kuragi area, when he started to expand towards the southern part of uh, Ethiopia, as I'm sure you were aware, there was a lot of wars that happened. In the case of the Guragi, it was split. It was split between um, the northern and then the western, because the northern Guragi submitted to him. The Guragi submitted to Emperor Minilik, and actually before that, Tahal Sahel al um, they actually had requested help from Nugu Sahel al of Shoah because they were under invasions by the Oromos at the time. So they already kind of, they, they joined within the Shoah kingdom. But a lot of the Western Guraki's rebelled by the time that it's uh, immediately came out, uh, came to the area. So what had happened is, I'm gonna get to religion at this point. Um, what had happened was when Minili came to those areas, there was a certain leader uh, from Kabinna, which is related to the Guraki, they live in proximity to the Guraki, who used uh, Islam as a way to instill rebellion against Amirlik's forces. So he used uh, Islam to uh, forcefully evangelize a lot of the Guragis, the Western Guragis, the Eastern Guragis, into joining his forces in order to rebel uh, against Minilik. He used it as a religious war. It was a jihad. It, it, you wouldn't really see rebellions against Minilik were definitely not unique, but this was this case was unique because he used religion as a unifying force in order to rebel. So a lot of the times he actually went into different areas and he uh, converted a lot of people into Christian uh, into Islam. He destroyed a lot of uh, churches. Even the um, when I went to Ethiopia, I was one of the reasons why I went to Ethiopia was to visit my grandfather's uh, church. And my grandfather's church was being inaugurated. He had built it uh, since like the, the 1950s. Uh, and that church was actually built by Abu Nazan Marcos in the 15th century, in the 14th century. But it was burned down by uh, Hassan and Jamal. Uh, he was burned down by Hassan and Jamal. So they decided to try they, they had a long-standing project to rebuild the church and in and, and Tamaska and Amalak, you know it, I was able to witness it being inaugurated they brought the tablets back they inaugurated it for uh, once again so there was there's a long history um, but this isn't to say that Muslims didn't exist because there is a long Islamic history within the Gurag as well particularly in some in particular areas in this eastern Gurag as well as in the western Gurag so um, of course there's a long history about that but you know, um, a lot of it, I'm actually, I ordered uh, the Ethiopian Chronicles from Ethiopia right now. I ordered the Zena Marcos Garaudios uh, and <laughs> So I'm very eager to learn about them because many things were mentioned about Gragis or specific areas. Gragis were mentioned and other places were mentioned in these Chronicles. So I'm, I'm awaiting. Uh, there are Amharic waiting. translations? There are Amharic translations, yes. Uh, I got four in one, I, I, luckily. So I got a really good deal out of it. So. I'm thankful that I'm able to read them hard because I don't know what I would do if I didn't. But I'm very eager to 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 read them. Yeah, no, it's it's fantastic. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot to cover there, and you're actually wearing an Az Imanilik like the second uh, hoodie. I can't. <laughs> when I start, sometimes it's hard for me to finish. No, it's good. It's good because you're wearing the Az Imanilik like, uh, the second hoodie too. So it's good we got the <laughs> the religion. Are, yeah, is that is that merch that you made or? No, I got it uh, from um uh the uh, line actually. I got it from his line. So okay. I, I you know what I got a rep. <laughs> that's dope. That's dope. Yeah, he's obviously a friend of the show too. He's been on a couple times. Yeah. Um and uh yeah, you know, distant uh, family when you go back uh, really far too. But right. um <laughs> um this brings up this very important uh question because a lot of the uh, politics of the 20th century and especially the latter half of the 20th century revolved as you said about wanting to balkanize ethiopia and wanting to pretend as if like the whole southern chunk was never a part of this idea that this ethiopia is a modern project and not this 3000 year um, civilization and so this is interesting right you have this time in the 1500s where grain ahmed um, who I believe from everything I've read is a, a man of Harar. I've seen some Somalis try to claim him recently, and I know he was commanding some Somalis, but I, I don't quite think he was a Somali. I, I could be wrong about that. But uh, he's coming from the east, and from the south you have people use different uh, words or verbs, uh, Oromo invasion, expansion, immigration, migration, whatever word you want to use, 
Uh, there's definitely some war. There's definitely some conquest. There is some assimilation on their end. And the way you describe the Gurage too is very important because they're assimilatory. The ones uh, maybe naturally who were Muslim through commerce uh, who assimilated, but then ones who were in, had that imposed upon them by Gurang, ones who were in the centers of power and thus they were Orthodox Christian, and ones who maybe were away from that uh, Eastern commerce, so the West, and maybe a bit more animism. Maybe there were animists around them. But could you talk about what what kind of uh, were there Gurage kingdoms? Was there Gurage governance when the Oromo arrived on the scene? How were the the Gurage kind of uh, ruling themselves? You kind of it's kind of sounded like they may or may not have been tributaries, and then uh, Emperor Menelik kind of through his recidivism imposed to the tributary status, but they also requested it. Could you could you kind of explain that part more? Like how were the Gurage being governed? And then what? How were they devastated by by the uh, Oromo? And then I want to ask you. I'll ask you. I'll bring it back up about Balcha because I I read a recent uh, biography that was released by Selashi Shawal, a member a pair of my uh, a parishioner at my church on uh, Balcha, whose I think great grandfather or something was the number one assistant of the Jasmach Balcha. Um, I want to stress that uh, Guragi itself is it was uh, was not politically. Uh, is not political was never politically organized in, in kingdoms and in, in monarchy there was never that sort of system uh it was basically um it was uh, i would say semi egalitarian in terms of the governance was always being uh go local governance was always based on chiefs um they were locally organized but there was never one unifying sort of gragi entity um even itself there was a there were different Gragi provinces, kind of similar to the way that Tigray or Amara was, because we know that there was a bit Amara province in, in Wando, for example, but there was also Gurjam and Shawa, which we know were ethnically Amara at the time. Similarly, in Gragi, there were multiple Gragi provinces, uh, where it was one, of course, that was called a Gragi or Gragi province, uh, or you could call them Gragi proper, but there was also different Gragi provinces, such as Aymenlel, and Muga, for example, these groups were ethnically Guragi, but they had they were different provinces and they were they were distinct provinces. I will, and this kind of goes back into the what I brought up earlier in terms of the um, the, the the subgroups of different subgroups. What was known as Guragi back then was traditionally, I would say, it was more based on the Sawatwit. So these groups, Guragi, if you have, I don't know if you've read a lot of the. The history about where a lot of the times antagonistic towards both you know Hamid Grang but also towards the Christian kingdom at the time and they were described as animists the group, people of Gragi and this is sort of in contrast for example to Aymenled which was the historical term of the Kistani which is the historical province of the Kistani and they're known for have being Christian they're mentioned in being Christian but they're known as they're they're listed separately as a different province you also have Muga which is another uh, uh, which is another province that was also known as, as being Christian at the time. So um, the their responses towards, you know, external and internal foes definitely differentiated based on, uh, based off of the province. The Gragi at times helped, you know, they also helped in terms of uh, rebelling against the Amir Gang invasions, but they were also known for uh, being very antagonistic and they were being uh, constant rebellion against uh, part, uh, uh, Emperor Susinius, particularly. Um, so it really differed in terms of the local, it really differs based on uh, the subgroups or the different provinces at the time. But generally, ethnically, they were all Gragi. But again, the territorial, um, the territory of Gragi or self or Gragi differed. You know, it, the, the meaning changed over time, similar to the way, similar to the way that Amara. Uh, you know, changed throughout the course of centuries. You know, we had a, there was a bit Amara province for sure, a historical province which was seen as the nucleus of uh, of the kingdom at the time. But there was also other ethnic Amharas that uh, ethnic Amhara kingdoms or regions or provinces that were Amara of ancestry. Same thing with Tigray. You know, Tigray. I know Tigray proper was technically Aksum and Adwa, but you also had the aristocratic uh, classes in the provinces of Enderta of Shirre were also seen as em entities, different entities, but they were ethnically Tigray, of course. So it's a similar process with that, with the, the Guragi. Um, in terms of what happened with the Oromo invasions, uh, like, I get, uh, like I said, it differs. Um, when the Oromo invasions happened, and this is very, very 
uh, preserved. Uh, the, particularly affected the Kistani, my 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 Buraki subgroup. So it particularly affected the Kistani. And um it was a long war. There was hundreds of years of war that were going on. And for a long time the Kistani were able to they were able to repulse them. They were able to uh assert their independence and they were able to assert their identity uh at the expense of uh, losing a lot of land. Um, so if you read uh, on Ike, uh, Ike Haberlin's, uh, a lot of his writings, he writes that a lot of the Kistani, the Sordo Kuragi had, uh, had a very long geographical span, spanning up to Wodjam, along with the ethnic Gafat. The Gafat, are, of course, right now are an extinct group, but the Gafat spoke uh, a very, very similar language to Kistani, but they were basically separated. And there's still a Kistani, a small, uh, an ancient Kistani presence in uh, Lake Ambo, area in the Lake Wanchi area in, in Ambo towards the Oromia region. They were basically cut off from the area, but despite being cutting uh, being cut off and having their territory reduced, they were still able to um, retain their independence. They were, they were, unlike the other groups, they were still able to retain their Christian faith. They were still able to retain their ethnic identity. Um, but the fortunes changed uh, during uh, the reigns, I would say, of Nuku Sahad Selassie, because around that time, uh, as we know, you know the the king of Shoah, the kings, the king even before that. Since the Nagasi crystals, Nagasi crystals started a re-expansion of of uh, Shoah and Amara areas and and re-expanding Shoah's you know uh, territory. And as a result of the, as a consequence of that, when when they start to re-expand and reincorporate those territories, a lot of Oromos started to push south, become became more pushed south. And they became more pushed out towards the Guragi area, the Kastani area in particular, which was located north. So as a result of that, there was additional um, pressures from multiple different areas. And as a result, many Guragi, Kastani Guragis were uh, uh, enslaved and a lot of them were enslaved. A lot of them, a lot of the churches were destroyed. A lot of land was taken and there was a lot of assimilation. There's still um, a lot of the the interactions between the Oromo and Kistani were very, it was based both on war, but also on peaceful integration as well. A lot of them, mm -hmm. marry. there's a lot of Kistanians who intermarried with the Oromos. A lot of them have Oromo names, and it goes back into the whole discussion with Abal Chabban. So yes. a lot of Gurakis have Oromo names. You know, but that's not necessarily. I, I also, by the way, give pushback on this look thing. Like, I know the languages aren't lining up perfectly with DNA, but I've seen a lot of like recent DNA studies and I did a funny clickbaity uh, video live about whether we're black or not too, you know, and, and really looking at the percentages of like indigenous African DNA in the different ethnic groups. And I was surprised by some things, you know, like the even um, uh, the Maasai tribe, uh, is it in Tanzania? Uh, or in Kenya, it, they have like 20% uh, Eurasian DNA, which is, I think, very similar to the Walaita, whereas mostly the what are called the Semitic groups, it's not like they're 100% Semitic. That would be ridiculous. Then we'd look like straight up Middle Eastern. We're obviously some type of black or some type of African, right? Uh, we're closer to like 40 to 60% range, and a lot of them are, are 50%. If you get somebody with the look of the Jasmach Balcha, you can't tell me that person is like, you know, uh, one of the Somali pirates from from the films. You know what I mean? Like, and and that's what you would look like if you were a kind of uh, pure, unadulterated Kushite. And 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 even them themselves, you know, they have uh, like forty percent Eurasian DNA. So it's um, they're not as indigenous as they think they are to Africa to call the Semitic speakers Mate or settlers, and particularly if they're intermarrying but also accosting and, and yeah. battling some of these uh, Guragi. I think that's a good place to start. Could you talk about Dead Jasmach Balcha? And from what I read, his father or his patrilineal side is Oromo. Uh, whatever that means, you know, it could be mixed even then. And his matrilineal side is, is Guragi. Did you grow up with any special emphasis? Because I do hear some people talking a lot about patrilineal identity. I have, I have one uh, Oromo friend who claims that patrilineal is the only thing that matters. And even then it's your father's father, which to me gets very ridiculous because I have a great grandfather who I have evidence to believe his Oromo uh, genetic and family stories, uh, but no, uh, no one else is. And so that would mean like I'm Oromo because my great grandfather's Oromo, 
you know, like what, what do you think of this patrilineal identity and then use the figure of Balcha to continue this conversation? I am agree. I also agree with you. Um, I, um, Gragi society is particularly very patrilineal. It patrilineage is more emphasized. I, I think even more into, compared to the other groups in Ethiopia, compared to the Oromo, it's a lot more patri uh, patriarchy is much more present. The father side is the only side that matters. Um, uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a popular saying that once you once a woman marries a man. Her entire, she has to forget her entire family and her identity yeah. has to be from her husband. Um, so Gragi culture is very sexist. I would say even in contrast to the other groups, compared to the other groups, it's very sexist, which I've personally found uh, I, I disagree with. Um, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with it. The fact that it happens, I'm more like, I don't agree with it. Um, even for me personally, I was raised completely on my mom's side. So everything that I was raised with was my mom's side of the family, everything, the culture, the identity, everything was through her side. So I identify through more through her family more than anything else. So I've never had that kind of that, that problem in terms of that, but the, it is true with, uh, in terms of patrilineages, it's a, patriarchy is a global phenomenon at this point. <laughs> I've heard arguments how a patri patriarchy was introduced by monotheistic religions and Abrahamic religions, and like, that's just nonsensical. But, um, you know, it was, it's very much embedded, even in terms of like a woman having rights, there's, there's, there was a long struggle about that, even with Nukuragi. Um, there is a there's a long tradition, for example, of a woman Yaki Kewartot. I don't know if you've heard of her. She was a woman who was fighting. She was a Guragi woman who's fighting for Guragi the right for Guragi women to be able to uh, divorce their husbands because they weren't allowed to back then. They weren't allowed to speak in meetings. They weren't allowed to do anything. They weren't allowed to own land or anything. So there's a there's a long um, there's a popular history around that in terms of women's uh, uh in terms of ragged women finding their rights and being pioneers in that aspect but in terms of going back to your question about Balcha Banav, so i've always known that i've always heard and i've always been familiar with Balcha Banav, so being Guragi. i think most the probably the most famous allegation of him being Oromo was based on the fact that uh safu was an Oromo word or in terms of, uh, he was being Oromo. um i think the uh, I went to Ethiopia. So when I went to Ethiopia, I actually went to a specific area called Melko. I, it's in Kastani area. And Melko is actually where he is supposed to have, to have come from. So they actually they actually say that he came from our area. There's still people who say that his descendants still exist in a specific area called Melko, uh, which is part of the Kastani area. And like I said, there is um, a long history of um, interaction uh, both peaceful and uh, violence in terms of the relation to the Kastani and the Oromo. Many Kastani ended up intermarrying with the Oromo, and when they ended up marrying, intermarrying with them, they adopted Oromo names, even if they're, they're Oromo. Uh, a lot of Oromo, there's a lot of people who have Oromo names, and so many of them speak Oromingya as well. They have no problem speaking Oromo. They can speak Oromingya just as fluently as Kurat. As yeah. So in his case, I've also heard this, from my understanding, I believe that his father's side is Oromo, but that Oromo side, a lot of these Oromos in that specific area, because they, they come from a specific area called Agamja or Agamji. Agamji is, is, is currently within the Oromia border today. It's close to what's called Waliso, but in the, in the town called Waliso. But those Oromos, many of them are maternally Kuragi. There are many clans that in the Oromo area tribes that are maternally Kuragi, but I, I uh, identify as Oromo and vice versa as well. So this kind of goes back to what you said, they only go by their father's side and then they kind of disregard their maternal ancestry, which is a completely different ethnicity as a whole. So in that case, I believe his father's side, from it comes from that specific aspect, from that specific background where his father's side was Oromo patrilineally, but maternally were Guragi, and then his mother's side were completely Guragi. It's the same phenomenon with Habtu Gurgis Dengadi. Uh, Habtu Gurgis himself was known for being a Chebu Guragi. Chebu Guragis are again another uh, are an Oromo are considered an Oromo group today, but Chebus are known for have being Guragi in the past. They were assimilated, so the Guragi even the Chebu people still exist today. Uh, their language still exists, but their numbers don't even number more than a couple hundred people right now. Wow. 
Yeah, so the assimilation, there's a lot of history of assimilation and identity and now the politicization of of identity is out as is even higher more than ever uh, and i found it funny very funny because uh, a lot of the the dichotomy of, of um ethiopia Ethiopia, mean that's where heroes or you know the uh, the upper class of being associated with amharis has always been an ethno-nationalist talking point but now when it comes to claiming certain heroes and claiming certain you know uh leaders historical leaders now it was these people were amhar these people were amhar despots now was it a no they're our group no this is our group you know before it was mini leak was this all of these amhar leaders and these war leaders were all amhar and now oh no they're there or, or no they're all this or no are this you know especially when i know what they come so i've always found that very uh particularly hilarious but um in terms of balchab banaf so um, I would say, uh, you know, he, he's a, he's an example of this, but people don't really care about, like, I don't really, it, it's really not a factor, like, whether you are Greg or whether you're Oromo, he fought for Ethiopia at the end mm-hmm. of the day, so. And he, he wasn't, like, doing public speeches in Oromiya, and he wasn't doing what if an recha ceremony by the river, like, he was a very strict Orthodox Christian from everything yeah. that I read. And helped build churches and in literally Agamja, he's called the Valchaz Agamja. Agamja is known if you go in any Kuraki writings, there's they say this Agamja is a Kuraki here. He was born there, he was he was found there, he was born there, and he died there. So it's like if people want to go in that road, we can go on that road, but it's really not that necessary. I think people's response, I think a lot of people's hyper responses have been a response to like you know, this uh overextension of, of you know claiming historical leaders as a way of like i don't know um instilling pride ethnic pride in themselves and we call yeah this is ours oh yeah, yeah, kenya, yeah, kenya, yeah, kenya you know uh and people have started <laughs> which means yeah. it belongs to belongs to us for those who don't know the order yeah so it's like it belongs to us this is ours this is ours and people didn't care back then you know people and i i want to get to this point where historical knowledge is very new for a lot of people for you and me, you know, we're, I would say we're anomalies in the case, especially for those who are born or raised in the West. Um, back in the day, people didn't know about like history, you know. Um, I, I'm, I'm a special nerd myself, so I've always wanted to find out more about it. But generally, our, our people are very, um, ig- I'm not gonna say ignorant in a, in a, with so much of a negative connotation, but they're not, they weren't raised up learning about Ethiopian history like that we really don't know much beyond the parameters of the battle of adwa or you know immediately most people don't really know much about history if um, the ethiopian history beyond that beyond these superficial they're they're important but they're very they're very surface level you know so aspects of our history we have so much more and as a result of that when you have different groups um indoctrinating their fam their families indoctrinating their kids that these groups did this to you these groups are your historical enemies meaning like did this to you this 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 it's a very very stark contrast you know groups are raised from a very very young age about uh, you know these historical events that never happened a very uh revisionist sort of uh history but then you have ours you know who are you know uh taught about ethiopia we prioritize you took we really we weren't really taught about any of that so as a result of that when these people you know when they become adults and they start to say yes we need like cut five million breasts or, or whatever because people aren't aware about their history they don't have the knowledge to counteract these revisionist history so what ends up happening is is uh what i would call uh a, 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 a trend of accommodation or appeasement oh yeah you know you know whatever happened in the past has happened you're right i accept your grievances and and they start to internalize these narratives these false narratives because they, these keep being repeated but because they don't have the knowledge to equip themselves to defend their history and to know that these are true we end up internalizing these falsities we internalize you know uh you know these false narratives and it, it's it's there's a very stark contrast which i've always found problematic but um yeah and even um i'm sure i don't know if you relate to me in this aspect but growing up i was always very enthusiastic about talking about history but it was never mm-hmm. with people my age nobody yeah. knew about this and it wasn't just about them not knowing there i think it's a millennial thing where even bringing it up bringing it up i was seen as problematic even talking lame. about this yeah. like not not lame that was different oh. I, 
even really care about length. I'm talking about I'm talking about me talking about, for example, if I was someone who's immediately busy to score it, I'm going to be So by giving me that, I start to contract because I know that it isn't true and I can yeah. provide that. So about that, the response from it would, I'm not concerned about the response from these ethno nationalists. Right? Yeah. I'm talking about ours, where it's like, don't say that. Like, you got you, not you know, yeah. I would say was, that happened to me not as like a teenager, but later in my 20s, yeah, as an adult, even even recently, as like from 2020 to now, I would say that 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 trend of what you're talking about i think it's actually linked and it's funny i talked about it on my last podcast which was like an, a whole discussion on just religion uh was remembering this uh, american guy who just passed away tim mckeller i don't know if you've ever heard of him but um one of his first uh kind of lecture series was against postmodernism and you know jordan peterson has made a career attacking postmodernism. Uh, my own Abba Thomas, our spiritual father of uh, white American descent in Los Angeles, who's very well known online because he used to be the guy who would answer all the questions on ethiopianorthodox.org that were in English. He's been in the church, uh, our church for like 20 years and before that 30 years in the Russian church. And uh, he, he's been talking about secular humanism and postmodernism for over a decade. And uh, like, it's very funny. One day, one of our students, because I teach them too, he was in his mid thirties, a little older than me. And he came from Oakland and he was like, did Abba just talk about communism on stage? And, and it's funny because these things are related, right? The Marxist movements, the Marxist Leninist movements that were uh, alive and fashion in Ethiopia, the, the philosophies of, of modernity, of modernism, and later of postmodernism, these things are not related. And some people try to like really paint um, Marxism and postmodernism is totally different. The issue is that it kind of evolved from postmodernism. We got this like hating of truth. So like yeah. the reason they want you not to critique uh, their marginalization that they talk about is because that's quote unquote their truth, which is BS, right? It's this total idea that there is no objectivity. There's nothing independently verifiable in history. And so just listen to people and it's much more feelings oriented. Like let them just like, like it's a therapy session. Let them mm. uh, express their group narcissism by mm. expressing their feelings about it. And you're, you're coming with, how dare you come with facts and evidence and historical yeah. record and things like that. Like I, I wanted to talk about like, you know, um, my great aunt, who's my grandmother's older uh, mother. She's from the village Tara in uh, Northern Shaw. Uh, she had a very funny, thick uh, accent. And like you, I didn't talk to my peers. I talked to older people. Uh, her name was Aweza Roba Kalic. And uh, I learned a lot from her talking to her and from and from uh, people like her, That's like, like you. And one day we were sitting at home and she was talking about how Az Eminelik looks Faraj. And this was funny because I understood what she meant. And I just saw the look on your face. You got a little confused too. But my uncle didn't. And my uncle's actually like obviously much older than me and grew up in Ethiopia, but I knew what she meant. What she meant is like, there's a way in which, you know, Dejaz much Balcha, because he's lighter skinned, has the more typical Habasha look. For her, the word Faranj doesn't mean white person, how people use it. It meant like anything not Habasha. And she was saying because he was so dark, he almost looks like he's from a different African country or something like that. And she it was just kind of like an off-handed, you know, old lady kind of racist comment that she was making. But I understood, you know, what she was saying. And part of that is that his mother, I grew up hearing, was like a palace servant of unknown ethnic origin. But the patrilineal side is the uh, show and Amharan side that is the kind of more famous one that we know. But like we said, because they put Ethiopia at the forefront, None of that matter. It's not like they had the 23andMe and Ancestry test back then. And we're doing, you know, like you must be this percentage uh, yeah. of this ethnicity to rule. Exactly. No, I, you know, you brought up a really good point. I've always, I was, re uh, interesting that you bring up postmodernism because I was trying to understand about, I was very frustrated uh, when I, uh, um, about this, not in terms of history, but in terms of mm -hmm. politics right now the political dynamics about yes. people responding to the current political events that are happening and i was very frustrated and i was very it, it was i i kind of gave up a bit because there was this this trend that i was dealing with since the beginning when i was talking about you know don't talk about history this is when i was a teenager this oh wow back, this was back when i was 17 18 19 years old 
me bringing it up and, and me bringing it up was like, you guys are the problem. You guys are the problem even bringing up history. And I'm not even talking about politics. This wasn't even about politics. This mm -hmm. is about history, you know? So it, it's different now, you know? Right now, I'm looking at, you know, uh, Gen Zs and right now people who are teenagers who know about <laughs> the intricacy, the, the intricacies of, of, of the local histories of Ethiopia and, and the, the chronicles and they're citing. And I'm like, okay, okay, young blood. <laughs> Like this was not it back in the day. Like that was not, you were not, it was very frowned upon to, to even bring this up and to even talk about as a Susinios about them, but they're very learned. They're very educated, the younger generation. So I'm very proud of them for about that because that was, that was, it was not it for us, for us millennials. It was not, it was not really seen as, as something very fashionable. But going back to your point, um, I, 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 I think the problem is we are living we are very comfortable living in a state of conformity what i mean by that is uh i don't know whether this comes from a cer certain time period but um a lot of us as uh as i would say my parents generation particularly um they don't like to learn about the truth they want to hear good news only they only want to hear about good news and they shut off anything else so as a result of that when you tell them when you expose them to the reality of the situation they start to not only reject you but they start to gaslight you they start to treat you as if you're crazy as if you are the problem for for daring to pop that bubble to daring to tell, to pop that bubble of, of you know the that the state of conformity because they're very uh they're very um they distance themselves they've distanced themselves from what's happening right now in ethiopia everything that's happening right now is like we've anybody could have seen this coming people could have easily seen this coming but because people wanted to um kind of pretend like it didn't happen you're pretending like it doesn't happen and then get shocked when it when it eventually happens people were very comfortable with that and you know um i had, I had i'm resisting a lot of my uh my 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 the urges to to glow because it's mm -hmm. like you, I I I told you people this like it's not that it's not oh, I stuff. give you props you and Tadla called this like several years ago um and the very you know crafty prime minister when I first saw him speak in 2018 I believe it was at USC when he came to Los Angeles um I was not like the sweeping crowds that were like you know going crazy but i was definitely duped to an extent by some of the positive steps he took for like the orthodox church Everybody. the fact that he would use the name of god you know like men listen them would could never like if they use the name of god um like i was hesitantly hopeful because i thought the man was intelligent and that because of his intelligence there's no way that he could succumb to the worst parts of the people who are adjacent to them. I kind of saw them as in relation to American politics, like, you know, Biden's not a great example, but like Biden versus like, you know, Antifa. Like Biden is not Antifa, you know what I mean? They're not the same thing, but there's a way in which they work together. And there's a way in which OLF Shanne works with the Oromo Prosperity Party but I wouldn't say they're exactly the same thing, but there's definitely this way they worked in concert. And I was like, there's no way he's going to just keep doing it. And for me, the kind of the reconciliation uh, with PPLF and how it's been playing out, uh, it really seems like they're going to go back and try to give them Walkait and Raya. I don't know if they're going to go to that extent. Like Even now, I don't know how far they are going to go. Um, we've been talking a lot about Gurage, like, the different political organizations of like how many of them get a state or are we going to reorganize it all into like other regions um yeah. there's a lot there like what what was it that stood out to you was it was it you mentioned this starting from postmodernism was there something postmodern about the regime that you saw or the people supporting it or what was it that you saw that you thought it wasn't going in the direction of like a true blue Ethiopianism because they they frame themselves as Ethiopianists, but it's really like a redefinition, a remaking of what it means to be an Ethiopian. And I think the biggest example is like this new Shagar city, which obviously Addis Ababa is already Shagar, but they're trying to rename it adjacent. That whole 
I think controversy uh, highlights that remaking that they're trying to do. I think the biggest problem was, um, I think, I think even when we talk about political intelligence, I think there's a big problem in the way that we display it or the way that we perceive it. Um, I think for a long time, even con- we've always, a lot of people have always heralded um, Avi as this this evil maniac, not just him, but even Mendesi Nawi. But if you look at the actions that they, they've taken, they didn't take political actions that were necessarily intelligent, because if you look about Avi right now, when he came into power, he had virtually the entire country in, in, in throughout his in his thumb he had everybody supporting him very fanatical support and now he's lost base within almost every single part of the country so clearly you weren't as smart as you thought you are in that aspect. that's how i see it. and that's how i see this whole um you know treating him as this evil sort of genius kind of um narrative i don't necessarily subscribe to it i think he's very uh he, he's very um emotional he's very reactionary he's very uh he's not in tune with his emotions he's very impulsive so i didn't think in that aspect but i think what he's gone up to the point that he's gone up to uh, i think is more of a reflection about us uh, and the way that we've been duped um i don't blame anybody for supporting abby when he first came to power because i completely understand it my 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 problem has never been about that because i was also hopeful to a certain degree my apprehension was based on multiple different reasons my first one the first one was the fact that he came from this political entity so mm-hmm. he came from the tplf himself he is yeah. a product of the tplf so anything uh, being a pro anybody being a product of that is you are tainted that's the way that i saw it. but i was also like okay let, let's see how things go on you know um but i understand why people were supporting him because number one Ethiopian Ethiopian net was was like at its lowest point. People's morale, people's morale was at its lowest point during the TPLF because Ethiopian net was demonized for so long. And you know the concept of even Andunet or any of these things was institutionalized as something as this uh, as this demonic force. So when you have this new political leader ousting the TPL of the oppressive regime and using these nice words, when you know, people use these words, these these famous buzzwords and everything, yeah. it, you know, it, it, people start to have- His oh, homework is low-key fire. His He has some wordplay. <laughs> I mean, he's known for plagiarizing, so I don't know if it's every- <laughs> But, you know, I, I don't judge people for doing that. My irritation has come from I'll give you the first my my first apprehension my first uh, my biggest apprehension uh, the biggest awakening that I had um, I think two months in two months in he was prime minister he would just started to acclimate to power I remember when he was making speeches uh, and everything he was still in he had yet to come to North America uh, I'm, I'm sure you were at the ESF and the Ethiopian soccer tournaments uh, I, I didn't go to that one I haven't been to one in a, quite a while. <laughs> Yeah, but like there was, they were organizing the, the mm-hmm. Ethiopian soccer tournament. It was supposed to be in DC, I believe. I remember the organizers. The organizers posted on Facebook, and they made a poll, and they asked, uh, "Would you like to see Avi uh, at the SFFA tournament?" Mind you, this was like in May. I would say this was May, late April at the time. So he was barely in power for like one and a half months, two months. They made a poll, and it was basically overwhelmingly in support of him being in attendance of the ceremony. Uh, but he was only in power for a couple of months. So what it ended up happening was they, they, they came back on their poll. They said, okay, we sorry, we can't introduce Avi because he, he isn't able to come to America yet. And the response, the public response, I will never forget. People were boycotting ESFNA. People were flipping wow. ESFNA banners and putting x and saying that you guys are our eternal enemies we're gonna boycott you we're gonna make you out of business again I'm, i can't stress this enough he had barely gone into power he had barely introduced any reforms at the time but the way that the public response was was just so radical and the way that they were so the fandom you were not a stan at that point i was like y'all are crazy you are out here boycotting because they didn't bring ivy when he, it was that was my first red flag but it was also because of the fact that it was not just support it was low-key religious deification 
they treat like so he like I'm like they were literally treating him as God. Yeah. I'm still seeing the pictures of him being yeah. his halos as him as Jesus. I have. You know, I ignored a lot of it because I didn't see him as the super charismatic speaking in tongues, healing, charismatic Pentecostal. I thought he was like some people called him typical orthodox, you know, like a hidden orthodox. I thought maybe he's a generic Protestant, like the calm ones, like Lutheran or Seventh Day Adventist. And so it wasn't until honestly, like sometime mid last year, that I understood that he was related to, and he got this word "bitzigan now" or prosperity, literally from the prosperity gospel, which in the American context I know very well. I never associated it with him because I was like, "There's no way he's into that." Where they have all these people who call themselves prophets and apostles nowadays, yeah. all over Ethiopia and yeah. indeed all over Africa. I think the problem is I I don't even necessarily the problem I don't attribute the problem to him because. I see even this problem, the way that he is he was deified and he was worshipped was by everybody from Protestant, from Orthodox, from Muslim backgrounds, every, everybody putting him on this 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 godly sort of pedestal. I, I don't even see it necessarily as this religious and, and a religious aspect, but more so out of the way that, you know, um, the way that he was attributed. It was it was um personality, cult of a personality. That's what I would mm -hmm. say. It was a cult personality that he was uh of course monopolizing off of he was exploiting that he was exploiting that and he continued to you know sure you know continue the charade of parading himself as this pariah of ethiopian and in that you know unity and all of these things and people uh, and people were going off of uh people were going off of about that and i think the problem was it wasn't just the regular people who were falling for it it was academics it was very learned, educated professors, people who were educated political leaders, people who are were traumatized and who know who should be should should be have you know the awareness to know when they're being duped and to, you know to to be able to do that and who were literally at his feet kissing his feet. So I was like, okay, this is clearly a societal problem that we've had. This is a cultural problem. This is a societal problem. I don't know where it originates from, but I need to find out. I was having, you know, discussions. I've held spaces with Luch Chedla. I've held, I've, I've talked about many, uh, you know, I've talked about, oh, yeah. uh, about this with many people. That guy goes ham. <laughs> oh, I, we, it's needed, you know, but yeah. it's needed. But I was like, I don't know where this this comes from. I was so, like, people, I'm sure you've seen videos who were, who were going, screaming his name. Yeah. I've seen pictures of him putting up in his picture on, on, a, on their prayer stand. With mesmer in the background, people like bowing down at his yeah. picture. People who are supposed to be orthodox. I'm like, when did we regress? When did our society regress to such just stupidity? I'm I'm sorry to say, like, just how did we become like this? You know. So I I think part of it, you know, originates uh, from the dark. I think a lot of this has to do with the dark, and I think a lot of it has to do with um this gullible this gullibleness that we've had. I was reading that um. I was reading a book that talked about uh, uh, how a lot of the people who were following the Derek were very enthusiastic about Marxism and Leninism weren't necessarily because they believed in Leninism, but because they found the slogans catchy. Mm -hmm. they found the slogans very catchy. They found that they thought it was really nice, and because they thought the you know the whole monarchy, they you know they put this mo they put the monarchy as like the, the bane of our problems the monarchy is to, to blame for everything yeah, so the we, need to be we need to be civilized we need to use these fancy terms about equality and everything and people were duped eventually you know by these uh uh things and i'm seeing a repeat about this um in, in our gen in uh, the older generation particularly i'm not even an atheist people call me ages before because i've said, <laughs> i've tried to hold them accountable because a lot of this has uh, is, is on them but it's also on, on on us in general and i think right now it isn't that okay you supported me in the past or whatever it's more so you've seen that these events are happening and you're refusing to understand that you're refusing to look at it you're refu you're you are being willfully ignorant. You are being willfully blind about these things. Why? Why are you being willfully blind? I used to think it was. Um, I used to think I was looking at it from an optimistic perspective, but now I'm starting to see that there are trends mm -hmm. uh, based off of um, ethnic biases. Uh, let me just put it. Let me just put it that ethnic biases have uh, has a lot to do with it. I think so we're seeing that now more than ever in terms of who his biggest support base is coming from. 
but I think it's a reflectant on how our society has decayed, has morally decayed to the point where we worship individuals who do nothing but speak. You know, we we give these titles to doctors. How many like how many times do we? <laughs> oh my God, the doctor, the way people were would shake their, you know, would start to shake up when people would learn that they're a doctor. Doctor, doctor, I believe in the way that people. His support is called engineer doctor. has become one too, which surprised me. It's the same thing. These titles, we this grandiose sort of um emphasis we give to these titles has a lot to do with it as well i don't think if he was a doctor if he didn't receive a doctorate at least i don't i don't know if his support base would be so you know but, yeah, yeah and i know people have questions about the these these doctorates that all these uh way had in the first place i i i think this is a, a great opportunity actually i think we discussed a lot what what i want to get from you as we close up yeah. is yeah. that you were very insightful even if you didn't have the solution you you saw the problem i think way before i did and others because also i i just was involved in religion a lot more than i was in politics like i was interested in history but i honestly wasn't even checking into the ongoings of of politics again until 2020 i had time on my hands and uh you know i i've mentioned it to others i started translating um one of the writings of minalik to abba jafar because again, I wanted to prove that Menelik was not Hitler. Uh, I, I was one of the biggest cr critics, honestly, of the kings, like super into yeah. uh, Austrian economics and libertarianism, and thus very critical of any kind of centralizing forces. Uh, but the way people would speak with such vitriol about the kings, it made me their number one defender. Like I'd be the Asmari making fun of, I'd, I'd be um, Alec Agabrahanna or an Asmari making yeah. fun of Emperor Theodros if I was yeah. in that time. But because I'm in the time that I'm in, I, I want to be the one that restores that, you know. And then, then I then I could be the the critic uh, again. But um, could you could you just tell people because I think this is the hardest problem, and this is where I want to get your insight. Um, yes. First for English, and then for Amharic. And if they don't know how to learn Amharic, uh, just hopeless. Uh, I I've taught Amharic for years, and uh, speaking is one thing that you and I talked about. It's own difficulty. I realize like. There's a reason why the literacy rates were terrible, and I don't even believe the the literacy rate numbers that the Dedic claims to have made because I've I've experienced it even with the uh, children of the elite. Um, yeah. I, I I mean this is a very small anecdotal thing, but I once ran a class for like several weeks, like nine weeks, ten weeks. I had nine students. Three of them finished. One of them who finished didn't know a lick of Fidel and uh, besides her name, and by the end of it, she was writing full sentences. And, and that's because she stayed with it, but most people did not. So anyway, uh, my question for you is, where do people start for history? And then where do people, how do people make sense of politics? So history and politics, English and Amharic. Could you give that advice and then plug anything that you want to uh, plug after that? That's a, that's a lot of questions. It's a tall that's order. Good. I know, I know there's so much. It, it's necessary though, it's necessary. Um, because that's where people get frozen. They don't know where to start. I think the biggest problem that we have to understand is that we, even if we don't think that we're, um, we don't have the knowledge about either politics or history, I think that when, especially when you're exposed to social media for a long time or exposed to certain people, we end up unrealizing, uh, we don't end up realizing how many of these narratives we've internalized uh, and we've internally accepted. And this sort of ref also reflects on the way that we perceive a lot of current political events. A lot of what we see, for example, we talked about earlier, this whole postmodernist uh, aspect of, you know, let people speak their truth, let people express their grievances, often is a reflectant on, on that. I think especially in the case what's happened with, you know, when um, uh, Hach Alu died, for example, we, we saw, uh, people being ethnically cleansed, people who are uh, particularly Amharic, but as well as Kuragi, uh, Sinti, or other Oromos and, and other places who were ethnically cleansed. And the response was, you know, when people brought that up, no, no, let people express their grievances. They're allowed to be said, don't bring that up, was often coming from people who are even not even Oromo, but were or Amara or other so called Ethiopians themselves. So I think a lot of them think that they're not neutral, but because they're exposed to social media because even you know people who they're from they're friends with they've ended up internalizing these narratives and they've internalized a lot of these presumptions they have about history 
and you know their their attitudes towards certain groups you know is biased it's not equal i think there is there's an unequal footing about the perception that certain ethnic ethnicities have right now away from even politics there's so much of a negative perception that i've heard about Amaras from multiple different groups, not even necessarily from ethno-nationalist families, but even people who are supposed to be uh, neutral, politically neutral, or people who didn't come from these groups. And the way they would speak about Amaras, I just went, what? Where did this come from? You know. So um, you might say that you know, oh, I don't know any political political They can say that, but a lot of them, I've realized they've internalized, and people have spoken to me about this. People have said like, I didn't realize like how much i was wrong about Sela amara people thought like amara was this higher you know aristocratic class who was always you know colonizing all these forces amara themselves people who even came from amara themselves or came from amara as mixed ethnicity or iraqi or whatever um so i think the solution to that is to empty all the presuppositions of the, the suppositions and all of the the assumptions they have about everything that they know about ethiopia and to start from scratch because a lot of even myself i've struggled with this myself i've also struggled with this from a young age i was also under the assumption even though i wasn't taught i was never taught that amharas were this whatever whatever but i also i also had this uh assumption that amharas were the always the dominant class they were the culturally the politically dominant class who were always you know uh, uh oppressing people i also had that uh, that assumption because i grew up with other ethiopians and that was the way that was the things that i heard it didn't come from my family but it came from other people around me it came from people it came from the books that i read as well when i started to learn about history so people need to um be very conscious at least not empty but at least be very conscious about Your you biases. know the, the biases that exist both in what people say but also in literature when people write history books, a lot of the times they they come from they have you know they have their motives, they have, they have uh, you know motives that reflect on the on the tone the literary tone that they write you know depending on the historian or the, depending on the author. So I would say just to uh, be aware that not just against Amaharis but also against any other ethnic group or against any other religion to be to to identify the reason you know for you know the, the reason that the the motive of the author and, and their way to um, describe Ethiopian history, if it's just a blank Ethiopian historical book, or, or or to you know infer and to be able to read between the lines, you know, to able to come to your own conclusions. That's a big problem. We often let other people make conclusions for us. We let other people dictate our thought processes, but we never you know make our own conclusions. We should be able to analyze history from multiple different sources, both from primary sources and from secondary sources, and from, you know, you know, uh, archaeological evidences and to gather them and then make my, our, our own individual, individualistic conclusions from there. I'm not, I'm, I'm not in the view that history is unanimous. You know, history, there's only one view of history. Of course, we know that, you know, there are different histories and there's different perspectives and, and everything, but there's, at, at the end of the day, there's truth in, there is one truth at the end of the day, you know? So I, I think that the biggest solution that we need to do is to get our, our minds out of this mindset because every single time, every everywhere on social media, you know, how no matter how biased people say, no matter how politically neutral people depict themselves as, they are always they always have their own preconceived notions. They always have their preconceived biases. Even if they say that they're Ethiopian, and so it doesn't mean that you know they care about ethiopian unity or they uh they treat all ethnic ethnic groups equally and we've seen that there's no better example of this than the current political party right now or the political leaders that we have right now so i, I think that's the biggest i think that's the biggest hurdle we need to do um and unfortunately you know history and current events are closer in political uh current political events are very connected with each other mm -hmm. What's happening right now is based off of these narratives that were, you know, that were narrated and distributed from the past. Things that are doing right now, things that are happening right now, and people's responses, people's lukewarm responses, as well as people's, you know, over enthusiastic responses to, you know, to certain things that are happening right now. I don't want to get into it right now because I know that we're closing, but you know, it's yeah. everywhere. Like the Silte mosques we were talking about. Yeah. yeah. So uh yeah i think there's there, there's so much we need to unpack i've done that myself i'm not i'm not uh you yeah. know, I'm, 
alone in that. I've, I've so it's good to, to unpack the biases and the to empty ourselves as much as possible. Um, yes. But a lot of people just get frozen. Like, I don't know, is there a particular publisher or library or set of authors or you named some individuals um, and, and some particular Twitter spaces, but like, where, where would you push someone to start? Whether it's the news, like, is it like, me, I've gotten to the point where I just don't trust any organization and I just have like certain individuals I trust. Are, are you in the same boat or where would you tell someone to start? Like who do who do they follow? Obviously, let's let them follow you. But let, <laughs> but where, where, where do they learn? Where do they learn about the politics and history? That's a good point. Um, I think for a beginner, I think for a beginner, uh, you know, I think Richard Pankhurst book has, as you can never go wrong with Richard Pankhurst. I've learned a lot from his books. Um, uh, Don the Liv, uh, Levine, even though there are certain problematic aspects, of course, I'm not gonna get into right now about them. They are, they do give an adept amount of knowledge about the histor uh, the history, the, geopoli the geopolitics, you know, the cultural um, the aspects of the society, the historical society. Back then, I think it's a good start. Um, I think even in terms of local Ethiopian historians, I think even Baharu Zaudi is also mm -hmm. not, not a bad place to start as well. I have my own reservations about his takes about, you know, socialism and everything regarding uh, the dark and the events happened. But I think in terms of the history, he does give a fairly neutral, uh, you know, stance about, you know, his, his depiction about Ethiopian history, history, particularly about the modern Ethiopian history from I'd say Tedros's era and so on. Uh, and, you know, it really depends on what aspect of history you want to start off from because there's so much history. Because all oh, let me tell you, people are always asking me about, oh, what can you tell me about history sources about Ethiopian history? I'm like, okay, from where? You, yeah. you know, are you talking about modern Ethiopian history? Are you talking about medieval Ethiopian history? Are you talking about, you know, ancient Ethiopian history? There's so much, you know, there's so much to go on to. So, I think there are certain places that you need to start off from, I think, to be able to learn. I think you need to learn from the early history. I think a good place to start is from medieval Ethiopian history. I think because that is the place where we actually have a lot of sources. We have so much sources to back that up. I think the whole even the case with the Aksumites is a bit um, controversial regarding, you know, the ethnic makeup and, the, you know, whoever, and always, you know, this whole ethnic, you know, oh, they came from the Sabaeans, the Yemenites, that, that's a whole different, yeah. that's a whole different. Uh, you know, a can of uh, worms, but I the think DNA is disproving that. By the way, it's more eleven. Even the DNA, yeah. I, I, we talk about the DNA thing right, right now. Uh, what happened? <laughs> you know, the results that I got from Twenty Three and Me myself, I was very surprised about what I got because, you know, uh, the whole thing, and I have my own uh, reservations about this whole Alkushitic Semitic, you know, or um, designations, uh, and they're reflecting about them being. Uh, identities because at the end of the day these are language families so that's that's the whole that's mm -hmm. that's another uh, aspect of course but yeah there's a lot like i give you know i give sources that people like want because i know a lot of people are very willing to learn about history right now especially people are very uh, who always i'm sure people always ask you of course you know where to start from for, for beginners or people who are who want to go into the intermediate parts of ethiopian history you know i give you know uh meditative well, data guys a really good also source about medieval medieval history and their interactions with the the other parts of ethiopia um but also i would say i still i, I would say i've learned so much so much of what i've learned has based off of has been based off of what i elders have talked to mm -hmm. i have talked to like 15 shamaglis when i was in ethiopia i learned an immense amount of knowledge i've recorded conversations i've learned so much about my own personal background as well as you know, history about certain other places in Ethiopia because they're not as talked about in, in you know, in writings. And it's nobody's fault, really, but it's just how it is. So, and that's why I wanted to do this episode. And that's something exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I've learned so much from asking elders. And even though they're not, they're not literate, they're not literate either. Mm -hmm. they, they, there is a long standing uh, tradition of, of passing down history from ancestor to ancestor. I can recite my ancestors down to the 12th generation. They can wow. go back way further back so there's so much that's been passed down but one of my goals is to to put that in writing you know what's not written down i want to to be able to preserve it um myself mm -hmm. because as a as a person who lives here you know i don't want that to die down it is dying down but i don't i don't want that to die down as well so yeah you know 
Well, that's great. God bless your efforts to preserve that. I'm so glad that that you're going to do that. And if you ever release that for the general public, I'll be the first one to uh, to hear that as well. So thank you so much, Sammy, for coming on the program and Namasek and for giving us this uh, this good survey of of Gurage history, which I think a lot of people don't learn about and hear about. And it's um, but it's 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 a part of the larger tapestry of Ethiopian history. And I'm so glad that you you frame it that way. So thank you for joining the program. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we should definitely talk more definitely in the near future, of course. There's a lot, there's a lot to discuss. <laughs> definitely, you know, for sure.